Welcome to this discussion uh, with Alfred Urey and Mary Hood. This is part of the uh, series of events that uh, the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame is hosting over the next two days, and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. And these Georgia Writers Hall of Fame events are also part of the university's Spotlight on the Arts Festival, which is going on for nine days. So if you don't know about that, I hope you'll check out what's scheduled and sample some of the events. But I'm really happy to be here to get this discussion underway uh, and really pleased that you're here. You have with you uh, information about Alfred Urey and Mary Hood, and you're going to be introduced to them formally tomorrow at the induction ceremony. So I've said about them everything that I'm going to say other than I'm very glad they're here and I really extend to them my congratulations on their induction into the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame tomorrow along with Olive Ann Burns. So we're going to get underway and I hope they'll, you will have some questions to ask uh, along the way. Feel free to do so. And my first question for these two writers is to ask them to talk about what the term Georgia writer means to them and their work. Ladies first. <laughs> I'll get you later in cross-examination. <laughs> uh, well, what does it mean to be uh, Georgia? Is that Georgia the state? I brought my papers today in the Gazette, Gazette or the uh, atlas that has all the back roads and the counties and the names of the rivers and the swamps and the creeks because it was a nice big uh, thing and my folders weren't big enough to hold all the stuff I brought. So I just brought that in. It's Georgia. Uh, I thought, what if you had a map and you just put on it what had been written and where it had been written about? Um, then what if you had a map of the world and Georgians, it was about what Georgians had writ written about the world. There, um, I don't know what the term Georgia writer means in some ways. To me, it's, it's a larger thing maybe than a map. Uh, I, I was born here and as you know from my earlier remarks, uh, no great writers have been born in Georgia, just babies. And that's true about any writers in the world anywhere. In Georgia, it's good. It seems like Georgia is a good place to become a writer. As far as how I feel about my being a Georgia writer, I, I like the idea of it. Um, since I'm from here, it would be awkward if I had been voted in somewhere else. <laughs> but. Uh, it's, it's just good to be acknowledged as far as, I mean, I can't deny it. Is that sounding creepy and weird? Um, gee, I wish I hadn't been first. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. Okay, um, I'll get better later. Let's just warm up a little here. That's all I, all I can say is I'm, I am a Georgian. There was a time I thought, why would that matter? And now I, I can't imagine not, it's not being a part of what I am because I have written about the state Things have, have uh, interested me in the state in such ways that, uh, and the, the novel I'm writing about, the one that just keeps getting mentioned, and I'm slow, uh, it's about the flood, which I, you know, I used to say the flood and everybody knew what I meant. Now it's the flood of 94, which was a tropical depression. I don't think it was even a storm, Alberto. And up here in the Atlanta area, north of Atlanta, we had 20, three inches of rain in 24 hours. And all of that water just gathered and started rolling down uh, overland and breaking farm pond uh, dams down. And the rivers filled, and by the time it got to Macon, Macon filled, uh, South Georgia went under in ways that are incredible. I have on my computer thing, um, what do you call that thing? The places I go constantly to look. and. It's kind of strange because one of them is a mortality for the flood. Uh, I find out, because I can find out interesting things about this flood, I'm going to know an awful lot about 
the state of Georgia and the hydrology of Georgia before this is over with. Uh, I can't say that I know that much about the hydrology of any other state. Um, <laughs> and I can't imagine being interested, which is a tragic thing to say. Uh, I've been many places, and I've actually been overseas. I've been, somebody asked me once, had I been in a foreign country lately, and I said I, I went, had been to Miami, but that didn't count. <laughs> so I don't know. See, I'm a Georgian, and, um, and I, it's, I was born here, and that's what kind of makes you a Georgian. But as far as being a Georgia writer, I think anyone can do it, apparently. I mean, if you stop here. Who knows, right this moment, what could be happening in some cheap motel, you know, or mountain lodge, or uh, on the back of a bus or somewhere. And it could be somebody just passing through and is going to blow us all away with their comments. So I guess I'm glad they're not here. So we'll see them later, right? That's, I don't know, what's a Georgia, what's a Georgia writer to you? Is it a person who is... Everything you said. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting. I, I do consider myself a Georgia writer. I don't live in Georgia. I was born here, or raised here, but I wanted to be a playwright, and at that time, there was not much way to be a playwright in Atlanta, although there would be now. Mm -hmm. So I went to college, and I went to New York, and I've been in New York ever since. But and I wanted to write musical theater then. And I was uh, particularly struck by Rodgers and Hammerstein, and they wrote, you know, those exotic things about, I don't know, the South Pacific and Siam and all those places. Oklahoma. So, yeah, all that, oh, <laughs> exotic places like that. And I, uh, I wanted to do the same kind of thing. So it took me a while to realize that what I really wanted to write about was Georgia, and seems to be where my writing heart lives in Georgia. And uh, when, I, when I really write something that's about me, it's about Georgia. <coughs> and about, so to quote a New York songwriter, for me, Georgia's kind of a state of mind. It's where I go when I have something to say about my own particular heritage, which is, I didn't know it at the time, but a little unusual. So that's me. I think it's interesting that we have uh, the two of you together today because to many people, you might seem to be very different writers of playwright and versus a short story writer. And I think there are significant differences, but also some similarities. And one question that I'm always interested in hearing writers talk about is exactly how they got started as writers. When did the bug bite? When did the urge occur that you made you aware that you wanted to write? Okay, I'll do it this time. Then. <laughs> I don't know. I think it was always there. I went to uh, Highland School in Atlanta, and I had a wonderful teacher named Miss Harrison. And she encouraged me to write when I was in the fifth grade. And I wrote. And I just liked it. it I, I, I made up things a lot. So I would make up things and say it was homework and hand it in. And she was very encouraging to me. And uh, she worked on the Atlanta Journal. And she encouraged us in her class to write a newspaper. So I became, of course, the editor of the newspaper and wrote most of the stories. And I had a sports editor and a society editor, and a, I don't know what I had. I had a whole lot going on. And I just always wanted to write. I was also interested in other people, in watching other people, and I still am. And, you know, sitting in airports waiting to get on the plane, and you're watching all the people, like, who are they, and what are they with, and who are they talking to, and why. Are, and I, I was once on a plane. I used to write for the movies, and I used to fly first class a lot, because that's what they do. And I was on a plane on a very short hop, and there was a middle-aged man sitting with a younger woman, and it was a hop from, like, New York to Philadelphia. It was almost nothing. And they had two uh, orange juice with vodkas each before we got to Philadelphia. <laughs> and I thought, 
And it was early in the morning. And I thought, okay, let me try to figure this out. And I, I thought, I decided that they were working together and they were nervous. Or they were running away to go. I didn't know what it was, but I like, I like to watch people and wonder what's in their heads. There. there the orange juice was because it was morning. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Well, I, I think my early writing, I don't know where it came from, but I liked stories. I've always liked stories. And when I was in the second grade, I wrote, in the third grade, I started writing things like I had seen, I'm sure, Hopalong Cassidy and things like that that really, um, you know, stay with a girl. Um, oh, hop along saying that comes under the heading of my business partner. <laughs> <laughs> this was good. This was irony. And a dragnet, I've always said that, had some huge in influence before I ever got to Hemingway on dialogue. And those the two cameras, one fixed on this face, one fixed on that face, and then cut, cut, cut. And this, um, I didn't even know what the eye, you know, what this was all about, but I knew that grown-ups were doing important things, and there was always this sort of uh, sardonic undertow from Jack Webb's character. Uh, he knew the worst, but hoped for the best, but he knew better. And that was there, and though, when I started writing my uh, story, uh, was my, uh, it was just a story. Until I was done with it, it was going to take as long as it took, and it, was, it turned out to be 40 or 50 notebook pages of a, a wagon train, <coughs> excuse me, it seemed to go through Texas to get to Oregon. So there was a lot of desert and um, terrible deaths by um, flash flood, anything I'd ever heard of. If there could have been death by flea bite, that would have been in there. They, and the, the dying scenes were always enormously dramatic, operatic. And the um, siblings who'd been parted because of misdeeds, uh, they died beautifully. And um, so it was like, it was complete insanity, but it, I was totally torn it, to just get away from school, it's get home as soon as possible and keep writing these things. So that the, by the third grade, I had finished it and I showed it to my teacher and she read it or started to read it and she said, I'll never forget, <laughs> ridiculous, and rolled it up just rolled it softly up and whooshed it like slam dunk into the green metal garbage can. And then she just looked at me. And that was saying, I know this means a lot to you, and if you reach in for it or you sneak back later, I will know, and I've won. And if you don't, I've won because you've lost it. And that was my first editorial experience. <laughs> <laughs> I use a lot of tape. I can't explain it. It's my revenge. If somebody editing me gets a package, there's always a lot of tape. My agent finally said, kind of lay off on the duct tape and the strapping tape, which I, <laughs> just like three or four pages. I thought, I don't know. This could get in the taxi door. This could, uh, I'm just anxious about stuff. I'm anxious about it. it's getting there safely and making it back. Um, so uh, early on, I wanted to do this, but I never knew it was a job. I didn't know it was a job. It was just, so maybe there is something in there that you can't get over and it makes you keep doing it. But I, d I didn't know that because when I had the, the moment that I, you know, I left it. And I think walking away from something that you've done and given a lot of time to like that is um, you're letting your art down, you know, even if you're only a second grader or a third grader. So I think that punishes me a little bit uh, when I think back. But I think I got to remember that there was more notebook paper and I soon found that how much faster a ballpoint pen worked on paper than a pencil. And I was on my way. And I guess maybe that means I, like you say, that we're born to do it. I, I hate that because it makes it sound like we have an inside track. I think if you can't stop doing that, it makes it harder the obsession. Yeah, I think so too. I think uh, I didn't have this voice inside of me like saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. You I like just to had do to do it. Yeah. I, I didn't, I just did it. Mm -hmm. No matter what, I just 
knew that I was going to do it. And I didn't know where it was going to take me or anything. I just knew. I mean, when you see it sort of dramatized, it comes out like he was determined yeah. and she was. But it wasn't like that. It was like. It's just who you are. It's just doing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you learn, did you have more than one language as you were growing up? No. Just did you? Uh, my mom was a Latin teacher, and I had dialects from my father. He was a New Yorker, a Manhattan New Yorker. And so he was great on dialects. He had a German, Irish, and uh, then he had a Swedish step-grandfather. And he could do dialects, and he could do, he knew uh, some German, and he knew Yiddish, and he knew a lot of stuff. And so I heard, I, I knew things that way. And with mom, she was trying to teach us uh, French as well. And so, but these were not naturally used in the house. I just had house. a good ear. I like the, I liked the rhythms of the way. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated by black English when I was a child. And uh, when it came time to write Driving Miss Daisy, I just, it was all there. You got it. I don't know if I could do it now, but I could do it then. Cadences it, and I things. Just, I heard it, and I, I loved the rhythms of it. Mm -hmm. And it was important to me to be able to do that. Uh -huh. I'm glad you did. <laughs> I'm glad I did too. Whatever the reason was. I'm We're running to. away from you. You've got to come back to you. Well, I'm interested in, in how you choose a topic. Do you, do you make a conscious choice? Is it an irrational choice when you, you decide to write a story or write a play? Your turn. <laughs> an irrational <laughs> choice. Oh, wow, an ir irrational choice. What do you mean by an irrational choice, sir? <laughs> One that just bubbles out of the ear. Oh, that kind of irrational choice. Yes. <laughs> I thought you said rational. I thought, is he out of his mind? <laughs> no, I, is he irrational? I mean, do, you, do you sit down and say to yourself, I'm going to write a story today. Uh, let's see, what can I do? And you, you reason it out. Or do you suddenly walk down the sidewalk and get hit by an idea and you suddenly find yourself at a table writing a scene? Kind of, yes. Do you ever get turned on by a misprinted word on a sign or something? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where, where it's going to... I don't know about you, but I never not work. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> it's always happening. I was doing Etsy looking at... It's stuff like Pinterest, but it's handmade. And I'm going, looking at all this stuff on Etsy, and I, here was a postcard, and it was titled "Souvenir Virgin." <laughs> I've written that one down, but I don't think that comes into anywhere I can work. But anyway, when I investigated it, it said um, it was a, a postcard of Lourdes in France, and it was it That's said great "Souvenir Virgin." Yeah. Can I take it? You may have it. I can't do it. I've already figured out that's not about me. I'll give you one. All right. When I, when I went to college, I went to Brown. Yeah. And we used to drive back and forth along the Merritt Parkway mm -hmm. from, from New York to, to Providence. And there was a town called Orange. Oh, yes. And a road a lot called, of towns called Orange. And a road called Grassy Hill. Oh. And there was a sign that said Orange Grassy Hill. Oh. And I never knew what to do with it, no. so you can have it. <laughs> in my, I have a, characters in um, a book that's coming along. Uh, they've brothers like in Carl and Auburn. You know those brothers. Everybody is aware of Carl and Auburn. Was brothers that got mad and then they just divided up the town. And so there's Carl and Auburn just right together. Uh, aren't there houses side by side? Or they were close anyway. You just told me something I didn't know. Oh well, so. that's Carl and Auburn. Okay. Well, my book has brothers that are are fussing about the survey, and one of them says, has, so he names his town that he has divided off, um, Dead Level. And because this, we're dealing with people who have had to sell right away for the interstate to go through, it's an exit that they're fighting about. And so he's first. He's the right turn. So he's dead level. <laughs> the other one named his side of town best. So it's dead level best <laughs> is the exit on the interstate. So, I mean, there's stuff like that all over. You just wonder. You can either make it up or you can just find it and put it in Georgia. It's going to fit somewhere. <laughs> 
Yeah, when you said orange, a uh, lot of the hoods I'm related to lived in East Orange. Is East Orange, Georgia? I didn't know. No, that. East Orange, New, right. New Jersey. Jersey, yeah. There's a town called Tai Tai, Georgia. Do you know that? I, I've, that's in my novel about the river. It's a great name, isn't it? Tai Tai. T-Y-T-Y. -T -Y. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> So I'm interested in hearing you talk about problems that you have when you're writing and how you have managed to solve those problems. Something that causes you to grind to a halt, that gives you great anguish, how do you deal with it? It's hard. Because uh, my, my writing is all dialogue mostly, and sometimes I just stop talking. So. You can't it's make you, them talk, can you? You can't make them talk. So usually what's happened in my case is I've taken a wrong turn a couple of pages before, and I drove them to a dead end, and I have to go back. It looks, but it takes me, I'm slow too, and it takes me a long time to figure that out. And most, a lot of days I just wake up and I go, oh shit, I don't know where I'm going to do <laughs> It's just, and then suddenly, eventually, it there it is. Yeah, you'll hear something. Uh, and I guess I should be thinking, well, I'm going to find it because I always do, but I never quite believe that I'm going to find it. And I think, okay, this is it. <laughs> you know, might as well quit now because I'm not going to get this done. And I think you have to be deluded enough to think this can be okay. Yeah. Even if it. What it do you isn't. do in the meantime? Do you frantically go paint? the porch rocker or uh, mailboxes or do some Martha Stewart project on the driveway or... Turner Classic <laughs> Movie. Ah, that's good. That's a good one. Turner Classic Movie. So you, you're looking for dialogue. Well, I think I'm looking for Turner Classic <laughs> Movie. <laughs> well, that's any, any excuse yeah. will do for them. Gosh. But when I come to something where it's just a balk, a complete balk and shutdown, it's take, it usually takes me a while to realize that I'm not needing to do those other things. I am doing those other things to evade. Mm -hmm. And I know it for sure if I do laundry or ironing. I know there's something seriously wrong. And so, I, but I ask myself finally, wh what is it you're afraid to tell? And it's usually that I don't want to take the characters where they have to go. I don't want to tell it. And with my story, Finding the Chain, I had come to a place in the first novel where the shrimp boat that's being salvaged is being pulled, like a, a, another boat pulling it, and it rolls over in the river and fills with water. And one of the men is in the, uh, in the boat, in the hull, and he keeps hitting with a wrench as long as, so they'll keep trying to find him. He keeps hitting, and his sister is on the dock and can hear it. They're very close to where they could have been safe, and they're not. He isn't saved, and I couldn't write that. I absolutely could not write that. And um, it causes the book to stop because her attitude prevented her husband from using, once the ship was righted, from uh, renaming it uh, and using it. And he knew, that was his dream, was to have his own shrimp boat. And so uh, when I finally realized the whole summer passed and I hadn't written a word and I couldn't do it, I just would go out in the yard, I'd walk, I'd walk miles, anything, just get away. And um, I thought, here's what I can do. And, I, and somebody, bless whoever did it, this lady in St. Louis wrote me that summer and said, then I just wish you'd write about snow. You've never written about snow. And I thought, no, I haven't. And it won't be in the novel about the beach. So I took him on a holiday, the man in the boat who died. This was before all that happened, and I, they went on a holiday. And uh, that was the story, Finding the Chain. And I was able to put them somewhere safe. That's the first time I had done that. And I've recently done it again with, uh, after a long balk. And I realized what was wrong, and I thought, then I can do this again. And... Um, 
and I'll probably be doing it again <laughs> several times. Sometimes when I was just killing off dogs in my stories, it was a little easier to get past these points, but when it's people, I just can't seem to bear it. So I put them somewhere safe, and then I can go on like, well, that's, that's, who, we, that's who we are, and now we go on with this. Uh, I don't know why that is, but um, it's not just Turner Classic Movie, it's for me. I'll find something on Roku and watch 47 episodes, you know, just one after the other of anything. Well, I, I think a lot of it for me is to tell the truth, whatever the truth really is. And sad that sometimes you get a little confused or think what it should be or what you would like it to be or what would be nice or what would get a laugh, but maybe that's not the truth and you have to really find a way to tell the truth, which that makes it kind of exciting. <laughs> but yeah, it takes, I'm still slow and I, you know, the older I get, the slower I am and the quicker I am to throw things away and that's not a good deal. No, no, no. When you finish something, let's say you finished a, a play or you finished a, a short novel, um, how do you sort of look at that work once you've separated yourself from it and you're not writing it anymore. It's, do, you, do you find yourself being a, a severe judge or, or n not judgmental at all? Or what's your relationship to your work once you're done with it? I, I'm going to start answering yours. I think you probably can't ever be done with it until you've seen, heard it in rehearsal. Yeah, you're, you're, not, you're not done with it. With a play, you're not done, or with a musical, until they kind of slap your hand and say, you gotta stop now, uh, which is about five days before the first show so they can freeze it. But uh, when something's really done, and it's been years since you've written it, and it's not really yours anymore, I tend to want to stay away from it, mm -hmm. because I get nervous. If I'm yeah. sitting in an audience with my stuff going on, and uh, I, I, I learned early on with, with Driving Miss Daisy that it wouldn't be smart to go to see productions that I wasn't directly involved with mm -hmm. and that I could say, I really am flattered that you asked me, but I don't go. Mm -hmm. And that couldn't hurt anybody's feelings if it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And it is the truth. And uh, I, I don't know about you, how do you feel about the stuff that's already in the books? And I never there? read it again. The, right. this, I read the story I read today here, uh, yesterday, to time it, and I was unnerved because of uh, uh, just all the things that I thought could go wrong, right. and just that it wasn't all that needed to be, and it's too late to brush it up, and too late to, it was too late, You're, you suffered it, but anyway, I, I think it's, I can't even look. I don't recognize the characters' names. It's been so long. Well, it's like I can't, some of the stuff, I've, I can't remember what's going to happen in the play when I, you know, <laughs> or when, when, oh, they left, oh, no, that doesn't come now. It comes later. Oh. And uh, It's it, agony. Yeah. It's, it's agony. It's odd because it, it is you, but you're like, it's, it's sort of, it's easy to say it's like your grown-up children, but it's not because you never really let go of your children, and you can't, you can still work on that, but you can't. Once something is out there, you don't want to be working on it anymore because you'd like, you know, it's, it's just done and it's just time to let it go. Should I tell that to my sons when they ask for money? Hey, definitely, <laughs> if you can. I mean, those, hi dad, phone conversations, I know those. I'd be interested in knowing what you, you all like to read. Okay, you go. Oh, me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> like anything. Just, um, she likes to read. Maybe. I like to read. And um, the things I don't like to read, um, I don't read. Except I do read, uh, do reader's reports sometimes. A response for a, rent, a manuscript. And the, I always read every, every word, just like Miss Nesbitt said. Every word I read. Um, <laughs> I like, I like to start, um, I like to do, have a lot of things reading at once. I have a lot of things yeah. going on. When I'm writing, 
uh, fiction, I tend to read um, nonfiction. Yeah, it's hard to read. It's hard for me to really avidly read if I'm really working on something because mm -hmm. when I, I got in the habit when I was a, very young of just reading books as straight through as I could. Right. And I like to do that. But you can't do that if you're working. No. But I, uh, I, I, more and more now, I, I like nonfiction. I like biographies. There's a wonderful book I'm reading now that John Law wrote about Tennessee Williams. And oh, yes. Interesting to me. And yes. I like things. I like what I like, I don't know, but I do like to read, I always have, all my life. I like to learn things, like, yeah. um, that's, I don't think there'll ever be any need for me to know much about locomotives, but I like to read about steam locomotives, I like to read about um, anything in the natural world, and Dreams, there, that's a wonderful book by the Swedish poet who had a coma, and he, when he survived the coma, um, he wrote his life. He was considered a veg in a persistent vegetative state and an unreversible coma. And his wife would come every day to the hospital and tell him a joke, every day. And he was aware of it? They said it nothing. There was no, the readouts were like flatlined. He was flatlined. And, but she would come every day, just that one thing she would do. She would dress and come and sit with him and tell him the same joke every day. And months and months passed and one day he laughed. He was still in a coma, but he, they said he laughed. Oh, that's great. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And um, there's a story <coughs> for you. And then when he got uh, back, he got back, he woke and um, he wrote this book about what he dreamed and what his he had really had a vivid and in impressive uh, inner life. In fact, he'd had a love affair with one of his nurses, and <laughs> he had um, written, and he had <laughs> these dreams where he uh, saw into the future and he could see the world as it is in ways that we don't see with our rational mind. Well, do you mind. remember the wife had come in and told him jokes? Um, <coughs> I hope so, but he, at the time that he was, he knew that he was somewhere, um, he felt that he was kept being kept in a cage. He had the sense of himself as being caged. So these, it was all a poem. I mean, his, his inner life was the most uh, metaphoric, wonderful poem. Uh, everything that was about his uh, being uh, held back or the places he went in the dark, there were times he was in the dark. And he told, I mean, it's an amazing human testament. Um, I, uh, I like to read Shakespeare a lot. The more older I get, the more I like to read it. Uh, we're sort of in the same business in our, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm way down here and he's hugely way up there. But uh, somebody that I wrote about him once said he was in, in touch with his dreams. And if you read the plays as they develop, plays like The Tempest. Yes. He just lets go, and he just, a lot of it doesn't make any sense, but it does. Yes. It's incredible, and I thought, God, how do you get there? And just to have the nerve to do that, it's remarkable. Uh, yeah, reading is a big part. I always tell kids that just to re read everything you can get your hands, read, read, read. Are there questions that any of you would like to ask these two people? Yep. Do both of y'all have taught? Do you have a favorite experience as teachers that you could share? When I taught, I was uh, chosen by the teaching staff at Decatur High School in Atlanta to come and be the color person for Shakespeare. And they were doing Romeo and Juliet. And then they had team teaching and the library and other resources in the media. And I came on Fridays, and they worked a whole week, various classrooms, uh, writing labs, everything for um, Romeo and Juliet. So I would come down, I was teaching at Barry in Rome, and I would come tearing down the interstate and get there, walk in, and there it was. I mean, I just had to start. 
and um, it was a spring project. There was six weeks or something like that in spring. And so my Fridays were completely there. I was there that we just, they were there like three or four sessions, you know, their classes were combined. So when I um, went on Shakespeare's birthday, I took in, um, I took in huge uh, pieces of paper. They were uh, good paper. I had chosen crisp but good uh, lay paper. You know, so I took in archival kind of paper, and I explained to them what a folio was. And I explained to them about Shakespeare's folios, and we folded. And when they had done that, they just had the one piece, and we stopped. We didn't have to get into any smaller units, but we had this large thing, and it was Shakespeare's birthday, and uh, many of them were inattentive, and some were over-attentive, and all of them were hormonally charged. <laughs> and the new version of Romeo and Juliet had come out. And that very day, a student, a girl, had uh, stabbed her boyfriend at, at their apartment. I mean, she had gone to his apartment and stabbed him. So now we had police in the corridors. And this whole thing was just this strange time. And then we did, we, I always had separate units because we had a long session and we did different things. And this day the art part was to make Shakespeare a birthday card. I told them, you know, when he died and how many years it would be. And so I had one student who had been, uh, he was allowed because it broke his heart not to get to be there, but he was part of the stabbing and he had to be off campus, but he was allowed to come to the class and the sessions. And when he, um, he gave his card in, everybody had, they, well, how do you draw, what, what about, and I said, anything. You know, we've been studying him and studying, the, you could do anything. So here's all these, happy birthday. Here's his, he's, he's hostile, confrontational, oppositionally defiant, and frightened, and brilliant, and scary. And Omar, I look, I open Omar's card, it says, Happy, happy whatever it is, birthday, Shakespeare. I thought you were dead. I was wrong. That's my favorite moment of teaching. I don't have one good, but I got one. I, uh, for a while, I was connected with an organization called Young Playwrights, Inc. And they would be clever and going INC, like it was really INK. I thought that was stupid, but I was still part of it. And uh, the deal was, it was a national thing where you, high school kids, anybody under 18 could write a play and submit it. And it was coming from New York and we would get 1,500 plays. Wow. And of course, I then realized that somebody had a real 1,500 plays and it wasn't going to be me. So That's what you think. It was. <laughs> okay. But uh, there were some very interesting ones. One. That's, this is not the one. But one was written by a 10-year-old girl, and it took place in a restaurant that had uh, a brick wall and a hanging plant over the brick wall. And it was a young man and a young woman, and he was lying to her. Oh. And the plant fell on his head. <laughs> <laughs> but the best one, the best one, was a play written by a young man who had only been in this country for a year from Hong Kong. And he'd only been dealing with English for a year. And he wrote a two-character play about a man sitting in the park. And the second character was a cigarette that the man was smoking. And I said, he had never seen a play before. And that's what he wrote. And I said, how did you think of that? He said, what do you mean? And I said, it's, it's wonderful. Uh -huh. I think the organization would like to put it on. Because we did about five plays a year. And he went home and he came back and he said, no, my parents won't let me do that. They won't let it be, they don't want me to write. And we never got to do it. That's a sad story, but that happened. And I wonder where he is now. He must be about 30 by now. 
But isn't that an incredible thing to write what, about? What was the dialogue like from the cigarette? Well, the man would say, uh, I, I want to go over there and make a conversation with that girl. And the cigarette would say, you say you want to do that, but you don't really want to do that. You don't know what to say to her. And it was, it, it wasn't was, a filter tip. It was, it was, it was brilliant. Uh -huh. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I just had a quick question for you about when you're writing in your process, how much is craft and rewriting and research and how much is discovery and that sort of uh, sense of surprise you might get from something you didn't expect to write? That's a good question. Uh, craft is very good. It gets in your way sometimes, I think. But when, when the inspiration comes, and again, when I feel like I'm telling the truth, then it all comes together. But then you can get, get stuck on uh, what I ought to do and what would Mary Hood do now and you know, things like that. And you get messed up. Oh, come on, don't start. That's cheating. I have one one little note, and I and I've just got to, this comes in right now. Okay, in 1980, I got this on the internet. In 1980, Emmerich Pressburger said, do you, "I don't know if he's a famous person. He's a, one of the Archers, him. one of the British directors, right. the team of uh, with Michael Powell." So he was. Uh, his, oh, I know who he is. Yeah. Okay. So he said, a script can only create nests in which magic may settle. And I, I thought, I would ask if, if you felt that there had ever been a time magic had settled in your script that you had not built a nest there, or someone else did, or it surprised you. Yeah, a couple of times. Has that happened to you? Yes, <laughs> fortunately. Yeah, <laughs> but you don't know when it's going to come, and you mm -hmm. can't ever count on it, and it's luck. And the sad thing is, usually it pays, usually it pays off. Uh, and the other old saw that is sadly true is if you fall in love with a word construction. Murder your darlings. Yeah, kill yourself. <laughs> Murder your darlings. Because you're going to go a long way. And one thing that's good about writing theater stuff is if you get good actors, and I've had a lot of good actors, when a bad line comes out of a good actor's mouth, they don't know how to deal with it. And they don't say they don't know how to deal with it. They, and I don't know whether it's just naughty of them or what, but it just comes out like all of a sudden it sounds great, and then it's blah, blah. And, and uh, I've had a lot of actors, which is good for a writer, say, why am I saying this? What do I mean? And you damn well have to know, uh, which is good for you. I mean, it's good for me anyway. Well, has that magic ever nested in one of your plays when you heard someone say something and you, till then you hadn't, or you hadn't got the nuance, or sometimes that could help editing is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think you're right. And that would be, to me, that's magic. Anyway, you get help. Anything, yeah, yeah. we're like magpies. We'll yeah, just take it, take it, take it. <laughs> yeah. I saw another question. My mother came from rural Coquit County. Now, for those of you who don't know Georgia, that's South Georgia. Moultrie is the county Moultrie. city, but she lived on a dirt road. She came as a bride, 1927, to live near the area of driving Miss Daisy, although she and my daddy rented rooms from widow women, as she called widow them. Women. And when driving Miss Daisy came out, she could hardly wait to go see it because those were those areas they showed in the movie happened to be her stomping ground <coughs> in the little five points area. Euclid Avenue, that area now is the um, parking lot for the Carter Center. And Mary, I started teaching in dynamic to Cap County in 1967, but okay. I from Florida State came all the way, but I was birthed in Georgia. But I came over to God's Country, Athens, and my last 28 years were at Hillsman Middle School teaching Georgia history. So if you were to take a peek under beneath my heart, you would find that my inspiration was, of course, teaching hormonal eighth graders. Now my question to the two of you, if we could take a peek, take a staff, 
what, uh, which of your characters or your stories is, has given you comfort all these years and will continue to give you comfort for all eternity that is tucked there beneath your heart? Which of, which of the things will carry you through? Oh, I'm going to make my cousin cry. I don't want to do that. Uh, 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 my eighth graders will do it for me. I go to Walmart to get my uplifts. Uh, <laughs> That's where I, I see them. Miss Daisy was about my grandmother and her driver, and he, his, his name, well, who, Morgan? He did all right. I don't think you need to worry about him. <laughs> but the character that I wrote, really wrote himself, his name was Will Coleman, and he was a remarkable man. He could sort of read, sort of not, but he was very wise. And I still, and he, he was around from the time I was a little boy until I moved away from home. And I often think about what Will would say about certain kinds of things and problems and what to do. He didn't give advice, he just, he was just wise. And I was glad that I was able to get that character out because I've worked with wonderful actors like Morgan and James Earl Jones that have played the part and, uh, and shared with them what it was like for that generation who couldn't read and who were disadvantaged but always wanted to do better, mm -hmm. always wanted to make the world better. They weren't throwing bottles through windows or anything. They weren't like that, but they always tried to make everything better and I think that's remarkable. I wish I was like that, but I think about it a lot. Now it's your turn. Have, would it be possible I haven't written this character down yet? You can even go home and do it tonight. <laughs> I, think, I think it's ahead. I, 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 love, I love the people uh, that inspire me. And maybe the people in the, in the this is good, this is marketing. Oh. Light bulb comes on. Okay, in the novella that will be out, I think in February, um, Seam Busters. It's about the women in the South who are still sewing in sewing plants. There's still a few places, and um, I found I had a friend whose granddaughter came back from uh, Afghanistan, and I can't explain what made this story begin. But she, we were talking about the new camouflage, which is very different and has very uh, unusual sewing ability. You have to sew carefully and you can't use certain kinds of washing products on it because it takes away the protection against night vision glasses. And the uh, pockets, I'm mean, oh, sorry, the patches are uh, Velcroed on and there's all kinds of things that are done. So you're in camp, you have a different flag. Out in the field you have a flag that doesn't reflect off the stars and you don't have white stripes, and there's a lot of stuff like that. And these women were working and struggling with this new product. And um, I just tell a story of how they uh, live and deal with, uh, in community, these working women. And, their, and the men. Um, I think it would be all of those people. But there were moments when I was writing it that uh, I learned to trust them so much more than myself, you know, just have to sit back and watch. And everything they did made me proud. We've got time for one more. I don't want to be the last. Yes. Uh, I was just going to ask Mr. Yuri, I'm also a Land native. Uh, how did you find, you know, being, being from Atlanta, I, you know, I know you had to grow up in the same, same type of uh, 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 life that you had. How did you, know, how'd you come to love theater? And, one of, and was, there, was there, were you going to the Fox Theater? I, uh, I liked the movies a lot. And my sister who was here, and we had a cousin who was a grown woman but younger than my mother. And she took us to the movies a lot. And I loved the movies, but I, my mother loved the theater. And she would go to New York and come home and talk about plays and it all of a sudden was 
you know, mystic. And when I was about eight, of this musical, Roger Hammerstein came to Atlanta, a uh, carousel, and my sister and I went with my cousin to see it. And I don't know if any of you know this musical, but there's a part in it where the hero gets killed, and it's the, the, the uh, heroine's aunt is telling her to keep a stiff upper lip, and she says, remember that sampler you made for me, remember what it said? When you walk through us, it went on and on. Uh, well, my sister had just made a sampler that said, to the world's best mother. And she used to throw the damn thing on the floor and say, I can't do this, and I hate it, da da da. And all it said was, to the world's best mother. So when they said that about, when you walk through us, I, I thought, my. A scroll. <laughs> And I don't know, that was the moment that I fell in love with the theater. So that does you no good at all. I don't know. We really have time for another question. Yeah. Um, I, just, I wanted to tell something rather than add something if I may. I grew up as one of Alvin's playmates, and he says he didn't remember when he wanted to go into writing. But I remember where we were standing on the sidewalk at, on Clifton Road, and there were about six of us. And we all stood around, and one of them asked, they said, what do we all want to be when we grow up? And none of us knew except one girl who wanted to be a nurse, and Alfred said, I'm going to be a Broadway playwright and producer. <laughs> <laughs> and the light shone through. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, okay. Good. I'd like to, I'd like to, I, that was a great way to bring this to a close. And I'd like to thank Alfred uh, Urey and Mary Hood for being here and for talking and with each other and with the audience. and invite you all to come tomorrow morning to the production ceremony here in the Special Collections Library. So thank you.